let's let's jump into your story so we can kind of set up those trials and tribulations that you went through. Tell us about the Battle of Danny Boy. Yeah, so this is my first tour of Iraq, and um, it was 2004. And before we, so during our pre-deployment training, we were getting some intel fed down that things had changed, the dynamics have shifted from peacekeeping. Um, Muqtada al Sada, who was the main militia leader uh, within our province, and basically dropped a ceasefire and said that all coalition forces are going to get smashed. And um, the last three weeks, this tempo be became pretty violent and really kinetic. So mentally, we were ready for, for anything, really, because we were always training as a worst course, because we do in the military. And um, kind of, yeah, when we flew in to Bajra, we then kind of done a two week acclimatization period in Bajra. And then uh, there was a lot of casualties coming down from Alamara uh, from the light infantry who we were, we were taking over. So we knew it was serious and we knew it was, it was punchy up there because of everything that we were getting told and the casualties that we were actually seeing come back. And um, I remember, yeah, flying into country up north. New Alamara was pretty crazy at this time. And, yeah, it was kind of the craziest handover takeover that I've ever been involved in because normally, as you know, when you go into areas, you, it's done in, I would say, slowish time that you know you get told by the other commanders where the vulnerable points are, the vulnerable areas, what's happening, the pattern of life. Mm -hmm. There was none of this. We were like fighting integrated so our first patrol we got in sort of you know dropped our bags and stuff off sorted ourselves out then we've been on our first sort of mixed patrol ready to do the handover and i was fighting with people who i never knew like this this is a different regiment but they all understand the, our training practices we're all doctrinally understand um what we're doing tactically so it was kind of i knew but you know, different organizations have different sweet spots. They have right you know, and different responsibilities. If you're going yeah. to go in, like you have, you have the same terminology, but somebody can do it just a little bit different than, than you do. And whenever you're actually out real world mission, you get the call to do this. You're kind of worried. Like I know that he should technically be on my left. Is he going to be in the exact position that I think he's going to be in? Yeah. Are we a little bit different, a little bit off? Yeah. So that, and that's exactly that. And, um, but we just kind of had to roll with it. We had no other choices. We just had to fight and fight hard with, you know, other members of different regiments. But we did that. And that, that, that tour continued to be, like, full on. I think we lost 14% casualties within the first two and a half weeks that we were there. So we were getting hit hard and, you know, people were, were, were you know, becoming casualties quite often and frequent. And... Um, yeah, the, the Battle of Danny Boy started actually, um, it was the 14th of May, 2004. And it was around about 14, 30 hours. And I was out on a vehicle checkpoint and it was blistering, blistering heat. Mm -hmm. And I was, told by, I was told by my vehicle commander, let's stop what I'm doing. So collapse the vehicle checkpoint and get my, my, the men under my command. So I was a Lance Corporal at this time at 23 to stop what I was doing and get back into our armoured fighting vehicle because we were in these warriors, um, which are an infantry armoured fighting vehicle. So, um, yeah, I mean, we mounted up into the vehicle. I put on the headset, the internal comms, to speak to my commander. Um, and he said, look, there's been an incident. Two British soldiers have been hit in an ambush. And they are pretty serious casualties. One's potentially going to bleed out. So we are kind of now on a rescue mission. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we started to go down Route 6. And Route 6 is a really... How many are with you in the vehicle? How many are under your command in the vehicle? Me plus two. Okay. Because we were struggling for manpower at that point as well. I mean, man, we were spread. Because we had lost a lot, we weren't getting our battlefield casualty replacements quick enough. Um, so we were thin on the ground. I mean, yeah, me plus two in the back, which normally carries eight. So yeah, really thin. And um, and these guys. And that's were, scary yeah. as fuck by itself. Just being out with just three people 
in an area like that. It's already yeah. like you're apprehensive because if something goes down, you just got you three. That's fucking scary just on its own. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, and like, I think it was like two and a half to three weeks prior to Danny Boy, I was hit hard and uh, two eighty four Soviet Union missiles come straight through our vehicle and caused all sorts of damage in the back. And, um, and that was, yeah, I mean, that was a, that gave you a pretty severe concussion whenever that happened, right? I mean, yeah, my, my hair was all burnt off. I was riddled with shrapnel. My good, um, the guy who was opposite me, a New Zealand lad, he had his nose kind of ripped off and, and, um, Irving, the other guy, the LMG Minami gunner had like really bad, um, shrapnel damage to his leg and he was like losing a lot of blood and then the vehicle started to fill up with diesel because it hit the diesel tank which is in the back so I started to feel wet feet and I thought it was blood initially but it was diesel filling up so but the scariest thing for that was our armor was now penetrable and that's what scared me so I knew that we weren't invincible in the back of these armored vehicles because things can get through because hence two and a half weeks prior to that already happened to you yeah. it's already happened and we took a lot of casualties and actually Johnson Bahari, Victoria Cross, was the driver of my vehicle, who then, you know, after many of his actions, he then went on to be awarded the Victoria Cross. And you know, so for our American listeners that might not know, because we have a lot of civilians too, Victoria Cross is the equivalent of the Medal of Honor. It's the highest award for valor yeah. that England has. So he saved my life. And then many months later, I actually saved his life. I dragged him out of a vehicle that he'd been hit um not too far away from an rpg a direct hit and it kind of oh he was in a bad way but me plus one other guy um i mean it was just pretty crazy actually it was the whole the whole town was lit up it was full-on war fighting and um i got out of the vehicle and pulled him out but i'm digressing anyway because we want to talk about you know the battle of danny boy so going back to that 14th of May, we were in a vehicle. We were going down Route 6, which was a main supply route from Bajra to Baghdad. And um, it's a very vulnerable route because it's only one way in and one way out. So we knew it's kind of, you know, it's a risky road to be on. But we had our main effort to go and extract these two soldiers who were injured. And um, I reckon maybe like 15 minutes into the journey, we got hit. And I've been, by this point, I've been hit pretty hard by all sorts of rooftop militia, you know, from the windows, from the doorways, from the alleyways. This was different. This was overwhelming, um, just super violent. I knew it was different because we came to a grinding halt and the armoured vehicle, which is 33 tonne, was shaking all over the place with the amount of ammunition that was, it was getting hit by. and. Um, you know, being in the back of that vehicle, knowing what happened to me three, you know, maybe three weeks, two and a half weeks prior, I had all sorts of emotion. And I think the biggest being fear, because, but I also know that fear is very contagious and I had to get a grip of it because mm. I was a leader and a commander still at a young age at 23. So I really had to kind of, you know, acknowledge the fear because it's, you know, you should do that but also control it. it's a big thing and don't let it overwhelm you because like I said, it's contagious and you know, you've got, you've got soldiers looking at you to, to make some big decisions. And I and think that that's a perfect spot. My favorite quote about courage is courage is not the absence of fear, but moving forward despite fear. And I think mm. that's a perfect illustration. And to people who I've talked to plenty of military folks who said, Oh, I wasn't scared of this or that shot the fuck up. Yes, you were like, you were scared and it's okay to admit it. I think that that's how, we move forward and have these guttural reaction do what's needed. Because if you don't have that fear that you're about to lose your life, it could cripple you like legitimately cripple you. 100% agree with that. Totally agree with that. And when I do, I do quite a lot of uh, speaking engagements and I say, you know, people who turn around and say, yeah, they're not, they're not scared. It's just like, yeah, they're just full of shit. And well, there's something shit. drastically it's, wrong with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you are, you know, when you are fighting for your life, you you will do everything to survive that and your body goes through all sorts of emotions and i was no different i was in this vehicle um it was getting hit hard the gunner and commander were doing their thing they were trying to identify where the stronghold was 
they did that, they started to return fire. And we've got 30 millimeter Raden on our vehicles and 7.62 chain guns. So there's a lot of noise going off. And, you know, it was a, a two way engagement now. And, but I knew not to get down my commander's throat straight away on the radio because I've got to allow him his time appreciation for him to do his thing because I knew that everyone else was going to be on the radio asking for a sit rep, asking for updates on what's going on. So I left him. And now, I've heard, about, you, I've heard you tell that story before. Do you think that if you hadn't been in all those other firefights at that moment, if that was your first real deep being taken charge, that you would have fucked that up and things could have went drastically different if you would have known to not be quiet and let things kind of develop? No, I think we're educated on that a lot. You know, we've got to, we call it a cigar moment, a pause, mm. two, three, chill. Allow the situation to kind of happen and then we can then dictate that situation so i call it a cigar breather moment that he is now engaged in a firefight i can't see what's going on because i'm in the back of this armored vehicle it's boiling point in there there's no air con it, there's no cold water there's only a small um window on the back door but with grit and condensation you can't see fuck all out of it so you've just got to do your moment allow that to to happen i knew that there was an engagement happening and then when there was a moment, I then asked him, Stick, what's happening? He said, listen, Woody, there's a stronghold. 10 to 15 militia fighter are dug in. They're dug in trenches. And I was like, that's different straight away because normally we're in the city fighting. Right. Um, and I said, okay. And he said, listen, we're still engaging. Wait out. So he's basically told me to wait. And then I then told the boys in the back because they can't hear what's going on because it's only me who has the headset on. Mm -hmm. So... I relayed the information to the guys in the back and said, look, this is happening. And they were like, okay, cool. No problem. And then a few minutes later, he was like, Woody, prepare you and your men to dismount this vehicle and go and launch a counter attack on that stronghold. And I was like, fucking hell, that's a punchy command. Jesus and I was like, Christ. yeah, I was like, shit, you know, there's only three of us. But the, that's the reason, a punchy command. What a, what a way to phrase it. God. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, yeah. So I, I was like, right, okay, roger that. Um, uh, then I needed to ask some questions. So I said, look, what's their weapon variants? And it was AK-47s, PKMs, a traditional Middle right. Eastern weaponry, RPGs, to name but a few. Um, I started to kind of do my deductions on that. We had our armoured fighting vehicle. Yes, we were outnumbered. Um, but we were professional soldiers and I like to think we were a lot better than, than our enemies. So we, we, we had a chance. I mean, we, we had to believe that. And as a commander, I did believe that we would have a chance. And, um, I said to him, I said, right, stick, the boys have been briefed. And, um, what I would like to do is get out of the vehicle and, and go and try and go into some cover. So at least I won't be going out disorientated and blind because I never knew where the enemy were because I was in the back of this vehicle. I knew I was going to be like, um, it was going to be a demand for me when I got out and the bright lights of, you know, of the sun and the desert, it was, it was going to be hard for me to adjust. So I just needed, to, I wanted to go to a position where I could then do my own estimate and have my own visual of that trench and where it is and what I then think I could do at that point. So he said, right, there is. When, you, when the door opens to, the le to 11 o'clock of this door, there's like a dried out irrigation ditch. That will give you cover from view and fire. And then you can make a, an estimate from there. We'll give you a rapid fire mm -hmm. and give you enough time to get the enemy's head down for you to, to get out and, and get into there. And I was like, right, boys, we're good to go. Stand by. And by example, I was going to go first and, and leave that armored um our armored vehicle now was that a cognitive decision or an instinctual decision for you to be first out i think i've got a responsibility to to lead my men by example i've always been brought up that way and you know tactically we can you know we can argue tactics all day long because there's no there is no clear definition of how other people would have done it different and if someone had done it different maybe they wouldn't be here today so i've done something right and i chose to go first I chose to inspire my men and lead them, you know, by example. And I, I believed in that. And um, I said to him, look, we're good to go. He gave me a mini H hour. So it was like five, 
four and then the door starts to open because it's on a hydraulic system. So when that door opens, it's, quickly rap it's pretty rapid, but it's such a heavy door, you have to uh, rely on the um, hydraulics. And that door went open and I remember blinking into like the flickering of pure light and I was like, what? And then put my boots on the, on the desert floor and looked up and I seen exactly where I needed to be and I just ran hard, fast and aggressive to this dried out um, irrigation ditch and dived down on, in prone position, looked to my left and seen the bravest of other two lads following me, big Fijian lad and um and rushy i they come in we had a bit of a laugh in that because it's a nervous laugh you know what it's like when you're in them <laughs> wild you have like i can't believe we're fucking doing this right yeah, now yeah and i was like holy shit can you hear this and i mean it <laughs> was going off at this point it was flat out so i was like okay now right, let's have a little check so we checked ourselves to make sure none of us were hit because the adrenaline i mean i, I say to a lot of people it's hard to describe. I call I, I, I call it an out of body experience. This adrenaline because it's a drug like no other. It's an endorphin like I've never experienced before. You know, if I'd been hit, and it, this is this is this has been proven many a times that many soldiers do get hit but don't realise in the moment mm -hmm. because they are so overwhelmed by this adrenaline that it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and. Uh, we checked ourselves, we, we, there was no blood and we were good to go. And I said, well, I need to go and have a look where this position was. And I remember crawling up, peering over this, this like bun line where, this, where we were in this ditch. And um, I was like, fucking hell, that's a big shout. 120 metres away, you know, trench warfare now. It's going to be like full on CQB close quarter battles. And I was like, fuck, that, this is going to be wild. But I had to maintain belief, really. So I said to the boys, you know, I've seen this. There's a lot of them. Um, I, I sort was of the 15 a, number accurate? It was 28. Jesus Christ. So 20, 20 were, were, were killed and eight were taken as, uh, sorry, nine were taken as POW, 29. So it was a, it was a big attack, a big pre-planned attack on us. And... Um, yeah, I kind of was doing my thing. And then randomly, out of like nowhere, another two soldiers joined us. And there was another commander who was a more senior commander than what, than what I was. Um, and another, another, just a normal private soldier had joined. So there was now five of us, which honestly gives me a massive boost. Because yeah. now it's like a section. It's a section attack. You know, we've got a section and we've got fire support from our armoured vehicles, which now we had two, Warrior fighting vehicles really punching a lot of ammunition into them that trench system so all of a sudden we are fully in the game now i mean i would never have gone there and say to the lads that we haven't got a chance i was always upbeat i always believed and we could achieve the unachievable because a lot of people even now think how and what you achieve was kind of unachievable but you did it it's it's like mad really so the, the other commander he did his thing, he does, did his evaluation, and then we agreed that we we're going to move as two teams. Me and my men, and then him plus one, because we were different platoons, but obviously the same company. Mm -hmm. So I just said to him, we're good to go, we're going to go straight down the middle. We weren't going to go right flanking because we never knew what was in, out on the flank. We weren't going to go left flanking because we were too close to our armoured vehicles and you know, blue on blue was a big thing. So we was like, we're not going to risk it. And uh, we're just going to go straight up the middle, straight down the killing area and just, just let, let's have it. And um, he's like, right, happy days. <laughs> and I, I said to the boys, right, well, stand by. We're, we're off and we're, we're going to go. And fucking, yeah, we just got up and were you, is that were you still out of body where you're like i can't believe i'm doing this and i know it's hard to like this many years now to kind of look back and remember exactly yeah. what it was like but i can see like even when we're talking like you're looking off to the right or looking off to the left and it's almost like you can still picture it very vividly in your head because i'm sure it's something that you've replayed thousands of times do you think of it as like I do you, when you're looking at it? Are you looking at it through your eyes or above, like watching yourself do it from above? I'm there. Yeah. I feel it. I smell it. You know, I can. 
yeah, I, I know exactly how I felt. I, you know, the, the adrenaline that I was going through, the look on the other lads' faces, and and yeah, it's just the heat, everything about that day, the noise, the mm-hmm. noise was it was horrendous, like so loud, and it was just like stand by, we're 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 going. It was like going over the top, Second right. World War type stuff. It really was, and. It was me plus my other two guys um, went up, bounded forward and straight away. As soon as we went up and kind of exposed ourselves, that was it. It was a two-way range. And when I say, like they say, effective enemy fire is when rounds are landing in and around your feet or you're taking casualties. And Mm -hmm. we were fucking ineffective enemy fire at this point. It was like fucking the bees were buzzing all over you. Yeah. And it was in and around your feet. And I was thinking, how the fuck are we not even taking the casualty yet? Just move. And then the other two guys and bounded forward, leapfrog does, engaged. We started then getting closer and closer and closer. And like 50 yards away. Then all of a sudden we're 70 yards away. And now I can start to see some of the militia fighter leave. They started to withdraw. So wow. I knew that we had the upper hand. We and had that probably hand. gives you like a fuck yes, was. let's go. Yeah. We were good to go. We were like, we're, yeah, keep the aggression. Yeah. Keep, keep the battle rhythm, you know, and we just keep punching forward. And um, we were getting close and I could now start to hear them communicate. There was a lot of them moving around in this position. And um, we were just about to go in and kind of clear it. And the kind of last down position that we were in, we, we, we have a word of command and it's called pairs, pairs, pairs. And you just go and you break down into pairs and you just go straight in and roll everything up and clear everything that's in your way. And all of a sudden, as pairs, pairs, pairs were just about to be commanded, they threw their weapons down like and surrendered. And, you know, when, and I say this to, and I've said it in many of the press releases that I've done and some of the interviews on TV that I've done, when you're fighting for your life, you do anything to survive. You're in survival mode. And when you have to make a split second decision under so, well, extreme circumstances, sometimes we get it wrong. But in this case, in this instance, we actually never got it wrong. It was, we seize fire, stop fire and switch fire. And, and now, is, I, was, I, and then I it can't was, even imagine. It was carnage, if I'm honest. They said in the newspapers, it was textbook. Fucking, it was no textbook about it. It was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of like um, trauma all over the place. Now, like there was militia fighters in half. There was body parts. There was, you, you name it, I seen it. And I was like 23 as well. Like I've just stopped on this main trench position, trying to figure out what to, what to do, if I'm honest, because there was weaponry everywhere. There was militia who were alive, so I was trying to segregate the, the dead from the alive and weapons everywhere and trying to get the weapons off them to unload and make safe because I was, I was really worried that they were going to grab a right. weapon and, and have an opportunity and, and spray us. So I had all this going through my head. And then, we, then depth, another position, started firing at us. So now we've gone into the trench with them. So we are like fully on, arms distance away in the trench with these militia fighters and with like loads of dead bodies everywhere. It's like, this is pretty carnage. I try to take a pause, like a little cigar moment, sort it out. And um, we managed to kind of take control of the situation. We, we done what we had with like um, the shamags we put around their, their eyes just so they can see. And it was kind of um, the element of surprise. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we, we were going through. And um, we we're going through like the POW stage where you disarm, disorientate and maintain the shocker capture. So that's what we were doing at this point. And then I remember just like once the control of that was done in this main position, I remember um, my sergeant major turned up and was like, Woody, fucking hell, what's going on here? And I was like, oh, fuck it, I don't know. But I couldn't even remember really because I was just in the daze. And he said, look, is the battlefield clear? And I really wanted to say at this point it was, not because I was a coward, it's because I was lucky to be alive and I didn't want to go through the same again. But because of my integrity and my values and what I stand for as a soldier, I was like, sir, it's not clear. I saw militia fighters fall back. 
there is do there's pockets of enemy another 100 metres beyond this position. And he's like, right, okay, put a fresh magazine on. You and I are going to go and do a clearance patrol. And I was like, ah, fucking hell. But to be honest, <laughs> if I was going to go and do a clearance patrol, it was with my sergeant major because he was one of the most inspirational legends and leaders of men I have ever worked with. What a yeah. guy. And he was by example. And we went up, we started pepper potting, um, probably got 50 metres, 80 metres, and then I saw a movement on the right-hand side and a militia fighter stood up with his AK-47. I shouted, target right. And before I even got right out of my mouth, my sergeant major was all over him. You know, put a number of um, rounds into his midriff and dropped him. Target down, eliminated, move. And then I moved forward and, and, and militia fired sort of come out of a, an irrigation but with his RPG on just about to fire an RPG off at us and I just like put a number of rounds into his chest cavity and also a couple of into his throat and I remember because it was so close it, this was like 10 meters away from me Jesus I remember him choking and the noise that he was making to try and gain breath and um, but I didn't have any time to think I just bounded forward and um and I said to my sergeant major look so we're really vulnerable because there's so many of British soldiers now on the real position where the main trench position was. We should be going back there because we've got a lot of cover there. And he said, yeah, you're right. So I, um, I then started to fall back with my sergeant major and I saw from like this corner of my eye movement and I looked and I brung my weapon up to bear and it was two more militia fighters stood up and I was like, just about to engage and they threw their weapon systems down and that was it. We Then we had to go in and go through the whole um, arrest and restraint and um, take them as POWs. We took them back to the main position and that was the first time that I'd sat down and drunk some water. So I talked through that kind of battle in about 20 minutes, but it actually took us about three hours from start to finish. Yeah. It, was, um, it was punchy, yeah, it was a long day. And I sat down, I started drinking some water and um, the sergeant major come up to me and said, Woody, we need to get prepared to go and collect these dead bodies and load them up into the vehicles. And I was like, what? That can't be right. I knew that call was fucked up. Yeah. I knew it was crazy because normally we allow them dead in situ uh, because by you know, Muslim law, they have to be buried in mm -hmm. 48 hours. So I was like, why are, we, why are we taking these back? That's fucking, that's, that's, that's messy. You know, I've taken another human's life, regardless if they're enemy forces, is, is a demand anyway, especially from such close quarters. To then go back and lift the person's body up that you've taken, it's, it was fucking crazy, if I'm honest. It wasn't good. But we done it. We had to do it. So we spent the next kind of 40 minutes lifting these bodies or putting... And you're already up. exhausted too. Like you've yeah, got about, like yeah, the we'll... physical and emotional toll that that takes on you then have to go and put... I mean, legitimately dead weight onto a vehicle. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know how you guys did that, like, physically. No, oh, it was hard. I think, you know, especially when you're up and down with emotion and adrenaline as well. One minute you're up, one minute you're down, and it's like, oh. But we did this, right? And um, we loaded them onto the vehicles. It was a real, it was a, it was a demanding task. And something that really played on my, um, in, in, on my headspace as well later on in life. Mm -hmm couldn't shake a lot of the things that I'd smelt and seen and it was plain habit with my headspace but at that point we did it you know a good friend of mine was like being violently sick next to me and I was like right you just sit there and you just kind of get some fluids on I need to we need to get these these bodies sorted out and they were in a fucking bad way because they were you know you can only imagine what 30 millimeter does to your body you know mm. I mean you're pink mist you're all over the place so we were kind of having to do this Anyway, we loaded them onto the vehicles and went back to our fob, um, which was Abinaji. And by the time we got back there, there was so much um, commotion. There was everyone was waiting for us to get back. And I, we got back to the camp. I, I dismounted from the vehicle that I was in, and then my regimental sergeant major was at the gates waiting for us. And he said, "Look, Woody, you need to go and take the bodies, um, the vehicles, up to the regimental aid post." The doctor's going to be there waiting for you to unload them. So I said, yeah, okay, no worries, Roger that. 
took them up to the regiment lay post. The doctor was there, the body bags were laid out, and he said, right, get the doors open, we'll start unloading the bodies. And I said to him, look, these are in a pretty bad way. You can smell it from outside the armoured vehicle, you know, faeces, um, man fat, clots of blood that I've never even believed that could be in a human being. I mean, these were like horrendous. And he's like, I get it, let's get this door open. And remember I said about the doors being on the hydraulic system. Mm -hmm. So I said to one of the boys, right, get the door open. And he's gone to press the button. Nothing. Dead. And I was like, I can't even believe this day. is just about to get even worse than what it already is. So what that meant was someone had to climb through the turret, go into the back and climb over these bodies and open it manually. So we played paper, scissors, stones to see who would do that. And my driver laughed. And um, he put like his shemag on his nose. And uh, he said, look, can you talk me through, you know, reassure me when I'm climbing through the back? And I was like, yeah, of course, of course I will. So we were talking to him, reassuring him, and oh, it was just a horrible thing. So we started manually doing it, and it takes a while to hang crank it open. And uh, he must have got it to the, you know, maybe you can squeeze out of the door sideways, where he, I heard loads of screaming. And I was like, what's happening now? So, and he's left the vehicle and sprinted past me, shouting, he's alive, he's alive. And I was like, what? So I've looked in the back of the vehicle and due to the nature of his wounds, he wasn't alive. But what he was, he was set up bolt right with his eyes open. So it mm -hmm. must have freaked him out in the back. And he come like running past and it was just a nightmare. But that event, that single event alone, ruined his life through trauma and mental health. He is still in a really serious situation now um, because of that event. 